My name is John Bene Ramsey and I'm five and a half. Um, the case was uh, called Wolf versus Ramsey, um, but many people refer to it as a Jean Bonnet Ramsey civil case. And I was contacted by an attorney who represented Chris Wolf. And at the time, Mr. Wolf was a freelance reporter. And it was my understanding that knowing all of this, um, and a lot of other people knowing this, it was difficult for Mr. Wolf to, to get a job considering he was a freelance uh, reporter. So he a suit for libel, and that's how the case started. And, uh, um, and the co and the attorney that contacted me had spoken to other forensic handwriting experts, and no one wanted to touch this high-profile case. And he asked me if I would be interested in reviewing a copy of the ransom note and known handwriting samples of Patsy Ramsey. And you know, to me, this was the most well-known case involving handwriting since the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. And I wondered why other handwriting experts didn't want to look at this case, but, but I did, and in the end, I was able to compare the ransom note writing to Patsy Ramsey's handwriting, and also to John Ramsey's writing, and to Mr. Wolf's writing. And um, there are many other suspects in the case that the Boulder Police Department were able to clear as, uh, as, as suspects through their handwriting. But it was reported that John Ramsey's handwriting did not match the writing of the ransom note. Um, and um, Patsy Ramsey's handwriting had some similarities to the ransom note. And I believe mm -hmm. that um, she could not be ruled out. But um, with my analysis, um, I, um, I was able to rule out John. I ruled out Mr. Wolf's writing. Um, but with Patsy's handwriting, I found over 254 significant similarities between her writing in the ransom note. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. That was Sina Wong, a handwriting expert that was part of the prosecution case in the Chris Wolf versus John and Patsy Ramsey defamation trial, a civil case. This is episode 6 in the Khan's Order series, the judgment that was eventually handed down by Judge Julie Khan's in the Wolf matter. Personally, I find her analysis, her assessment, her judgment of the handwriting section of that ransom note particularly infuriating and kind of hard to bear. In this episode, we'll be dealing with pages 19 and 20, which deal with the ransom note. The Khan's order later on goes into some detail, basically championing the cause of the defense experts, handwriting experts, and basically invalidating, uh, undermining the um, prosecution handwriting experts, among them Sina Wong. Before we get to today's episode, thank you to the hundred or so of you who have subscribed since the last video. If you haven't subscribed, please do like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So we're going to come back to Sina Wong, but before we do, let's just jump right into the, the analysis on the ransom note, the judgment, the, the final word, I guess, from the judge on the rans on the ransom note based on what she heard from the experts. So this is quoting from page 19 of the Khan's order. The ransom note is believed by all parties to have been written by the killer or an accomplice of the killer and remains an extremely important clue in the murder investigation. Plaintiff claims that the single best piece of evidence that ties Mrs. Ramsey to the crime is the ransom note. Mrs. Ramsey, however, flatly denies that she had anything to do with the note's creation. Due to the pivotal role the ransom note plays in plaintiff's allegation that Mrs. Ramsey was the murderer of her child, the facts surrounding the ransom note will be discussed in detail. And that's the end of the quote. Now, what I find pretty incredible about the this part of the judgment, bear in mind I think a large part of the psychology of Steve Thomas was formed by using the sort of the construct, the concept 
that whoever wrote the ransom note killed John Bonet. Whoever wrote the ransom note, ransom note covered up what happened to John Bonet, what they did to John Bonet. And within that construct, it was quite simple to say, Patsy wrote the ransom note, which I agree with, and Patsy killed John Bonet, which I don't agree with. And so this was the narrow-minded thinking that got them into the sort of quandary. Now, I think if you take the opposite position where you say, I think Patsy's innocent, then I think you're going to try to find excuses. But within this construct of whoever wrote the ransom note killed John Bonet, if you're going to say, well, Patsy didn't kill John Bonet, I think you're going to be tempted to say, I don't think Patsy wrote the ransom note. Does that make sense? So you heard Sina Wong saying she found something like 254 significant similarities between the ransom note and Patsy's handwriting. And that kind of flies in the face of what is being purported here. What I do think is quite crazy is you have a situation that's literally like pu pulling a rabbit out of a hat, which is you have this ransom note and then someone comes along and says, wow, it's nothing like Patsy's handwriting. There's absolutely no reason to think that Patsy could have written it. And, you know, there obviously are people who would look at it and say, mm, this doesn't mean anything. I don't see anything here. And I think I did uh, show this. Uh, I, may, I may have done it on Patreon where Patsy is literally asked what, when she was deposed and she's shown a couple of letters that look very, very similar, maybe five or six letters. And Donna Offman asks, you know, do you, do you see any similarities between the, le the letter, let's say it's A, and then you, you can actually see the letters, the letter A from the ransom note and Patsy's handwriting, and then you hear Patsy sort of saying all the things that she sees are different. Well, the, the one letter on the one side is thicker than the other one, or whatever and um, it's literally like showing someone two oranges in a way in a sense now obviously they're not the same they're two different oranges the one might be slightly smaller and the other one slightly um, mishappen or whatever um, and then saying you know what is the similarity between those two and then you say well Actually, you know, I'm not even sure if that other one is an orange. It could be an apple. It could be a peach. It could be a watermelon. It could even be a pomegranate. It could be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's kind of absurd. Is are we talking about the same thing here or not? And in this sense, I don't think you need to be a handwriting expert. But what happens here is literally the conjuring of reality from something that looks a certain way. So, that, as I say two oranges side by side um, do they look similar to you and let's say factually there are two oranges you know if you had to taste them you'd say they're oranges if you had to scientifically test them you'd say they're oranges but you have an expert coming along who says you know what that is an orange but but that is an apple and then that becomes legal fact and interestingly uh, I think CNN used this iconography in their advertising to show I think an apple and a banana and saying, you know, CNN is an apple. It's the truth. It is whatever. I find all of this terrifying. I find it terrifying that you can see a certain kind of reality and then you can have a judge proclaim um, legal, legally binding things on something which basically conjures something into something else. It conjures reality. And you would actually expect in a court of law for reality to be manifest, not unmanifested. And I can tell you, I've sat in on a couple of court cases where I was horrified. You might, uh, if you don't know me very well, if you haven't read any of my books, you will think that what I'm about to say is a uh, um, perhaps even a narcissistic statement, a grand statement, an arrogant statement. But I can tell you, I was shocked to find that, you know, as a true crime writer, you can know a case better than a judge can know a case. And what I mean by that is you can spend, as a true crime writer, several months working on a single case, knowing it inside out, whereas the lawyers working on the same case, the judges 
um, you know, listening to the same case, they are actually having their attention um, sort of squandered or whatever um, on lots of different other things. And so you can actually know a lot of the, the nuances, the subtleties, the details better than a judge can or, you know, the lawyers that are involved. And, you know, it is quite important in some of these high profile cases where you've got elite lawyers, elite defense lawyers, they are dedicated 100 percent often to their clients. And because of that, they win the day. And isn't that what happened here? You know, they are incentivized to find those little subtle aberrations and and emphasize them. So let's go back to the Khan's order. We now midway through page 19. She, she says, quote, the ransom note was quite long and in fact is one of the longest ransom notes in the history of kidnapping cases. This fact is important because the longer a document is, the harder it becomes to disguise one's handwriting. That's quite an important point. You know, it's a long document. And so the longer it is, the more difficult it becomes to maintain whatever disguise you started off at the beginning to the end okay so she goes on to write the ransom note is addressed to mr ramsey alone and purports to be written by a group of individuals who represent a small foreign faction that have kidnapped the defendant's daughter and seek one hundred eighteen thousand dollars for a safe return the ransom note was signed sbtc after the salutation victory the author of the ransom note instructs Mr. Ramsey to use that good southern common sense and obviously inaccurate rep uh, reference as Mr. Ramsey was originally from Michigan, whereas Mrs. Ramsey was originally from West Virginia. Uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about that. Uh, you know, there are other possible misrepresentations in the ransom note, such as the spelling of possession and business. In the one case, there's a S missing, and in another, there's an S added, and that is right at the beginning of the ransom note. And then, basically, for the rest of the ransom note, the spelling is all on point, including words like attaché. So, I don't really want to make this my assessment of the ransom note. I want to defer to Sina Wong. So, let's listen to what she says. The benefit of analyzing a longer note is that you have more handwriting to work with. When I looked at the first page, I noticed that the writing was slow, a little awkward, but as I progressed to the second page and the third page, I saw that the writing was more fluid, written more naturally. It tells me that what we're dealing with was a disguised writing. It's difficult to try and hide your natural habits of your handwriting. You can change it for a little bit, for a sentence or a paragraph, but once you go beyond that, your natural handwriting characteristics will come out. And I think that was Sina Wong talking in a ABC 2020 documentary. We're going to come back to her in due course. But something else I just want to mention about the reference to SBTC and Victory. First of all, there was a plaque that is uh, found in the Ramsey home, in fact, in the basement which is addressed to John Bennett Ramsey and is related to Subic Bay training camp in the Philippines. And it is incorrectly um, part of the contextual framework of the wine cellar in another documentary, I think Investigation Discovery, where you sort of see the wine cellar, a mock-up of it, you see the blanket, and then you see this plaque kind of in the background. The idea is true that this SBTC was on a plaque, but it was actually, I think, in a closet off from the from the train room. But in any event, it was in a separate room. I think there was sort of uh, rolls of either wallpaper or possibly Christmas wrapping paper. And behind that, you can see the plaque lying down. Now, I found a screen grab of this on the instagram site of cotton star you can go and check that out in the beginning i didn't think it was the same plaque just because of the irregular shapings of it but if you look carefully it does look like it's the same thing also on cotton stars instagram is a 
a note from the Philipp from the Philippines with the word victory written on it and so you can imagine the ransom note writer if she was trying to cover a an accessory or the killer or whomever um, or he was trying to cover an accessory or the killer you can imagine that there would be this urgency to try and quickly invent some kind of spiel some kind of scenario and what would make more sense than some kind of foreign faction based in the Philippines. I've been to the Philippines myself. The Philippines do have some uh, uh, groups within them that are classified as, I don't want to say the word, but I think you know what I'm referring to. And so that would actually be quite credible. So the Victory and the SPTC can actually be sourced to the, the Ramsey home. John Ramsey actually served in the Navy, I believe, in the Philippines, in Subic Bay. As I say, I've been to the Philippines and I'm aware of, certainly when I was in Manila, the security concerns that are there. I was even at a resort in North Palawan and you sometimes see people in military fatigues trying to um, maintain security across the country. Of course, none of this is mentioned in the judgment. I'm also not sure whether I understand saying, you know, something is obviously inaccurate in terms of Mr. Ramsey when they both came from Atlanta, Georgia, which is a southern state, isn't it? Both the Ramseys came from Atlanta, Georgia when they moved to Boulder, Colorado. Not so. Something else to bear in mind is, to my eye, and you know, maybe it's just the difference between someone who has an eye for detail and somebody who doesn't, but you can clearly see that the handwriting in the beginning, in the, verse, in the very first few lines, is quite um, shaky. It's almost purposefully shaky. The, the word that is much bigger than the other words and just doesn't seem to be um, written properly. The word L is often squiggly and that does settle down especially if you go to the very last paragraph you can see that the writing there is quite consistent whereas the writing in the beginning is quite erratic on the on the middle page you can look at the word if you know if you talk to a stray dog she dies or whatever the word if i think in one of the instances is written fairly normally there's there's no idios there's no squiggliness in the i or the if Whereas the second word, if, has got some squiggliness added to it. You can also see in the letter L, especially on the first page, there is some squiggliness added to the, the handwriting. So to my eye, you can definitely see the writing evolve or devolve from a highly disguised state to a less disguised state right at the end. Sina Wong also brings up additional idiosyncrasies which we're going to listen to right now. Again, this is, I think, from the ABC documentary in 2016. When I look at a suspect's handwriting, I look at the characteristics that are unique to that writer. These are the five very unique variations of the letter E that the ransom note writer and Patsy Ramsey share. Here, Patsy's C is very distinct because it is compressed, it's pointed on the left side, and you see that it's also similar in the C on the ransom note. That's a Q that looks like a number eight. How many people write their Qs with the number eight? I don't, do you? In this case, I found over 200 similarities between Patsy Ramsey's handwriting and the ransom note. So, it's highly probable that Patsy Ramsey wrote the ransom note. So that's Sina Wong from John Bonet, An American Murder Mystery. Now let's go to page 20 in the Khan's order. Quote, in addition, the ransom note was drafted on paper taken from the middle of a pad of paper located at the defendant's home and with a pen found at the defendant's home. Additional sheets were missing from the pad and were never located at the defendant's home. The pen used to write the ransom note was sourced to the defendant's home and found placed back in its normal place by the phone. Finally, there was another page in the pad that had written on it Mr. and Mrs. I, which many believe to have been an early false start of the ransom note. 
That's pretty compelling evidence. And so quickly the order deals with factors that undermine the accuracy or the credibility or the validity of this evidence. Quote, both parties agree that the ransom note is not an ideal specimen for handwriting analysis, primarily due to the type of writing instrument, a broad fiber tip pen used to draft the note. This type of pen distorts and masks fine details to an extent not achievable by other types of pen, as for example a ballpoint pen. In addition, the stroke direction used to construct certain letters and subtle handwriting features, such as hesitations and pen lifts, are difficult to ascertain because of the pen used in the ransom note. End quote. So quite a lot of distortion and muddiness. Oh, now it's very difficult to, for, despite three pages of handwriting, we can't actually uh, do handwriting analysis because of the type of pen used. Now, what isn't acknowledged here is when Patsy's had to submit handwriting samples, I think she used, in some cases, the same kind of felt to pen, but also probably a ballpoint pen and then they also used lots of other samples of her handwriting. Now I will provide in the description a the full report from Sina Wong giving all the different kinds of handwriting samples and exemplars that they sourced to either Patsy or the Ramsey home or possibly the home in Michigan. Some of those sources include besides the ransom note a two-page letter addressed to Miss Kitt, dated Wednesday, June 4th, I presume 1996. A greeting card pre-printed with wishing you a bright and beautiful holiday season, which I also presume is from 1996. Color photography of a photograph signed, Welcome to the Northwest Territory. Um, a color photocopy of a photograph box with Ramsey written in the lower right corner. Color photocopy of a photo with four children, printed at the base of the photo, rainbow fish players. A color photocopy of a photo scrapbook with handwriting, this me when I was first born. That's my mom and the doctor, etc, etc. Um, a round metal button with hand printing, hello, I'm Marilyn Monroe. And then the Ramsey writing report. So quite a lot of handwriting samples that were sourced over there. As I say, you can go through the link from a candy rose in the description to go through all the similarities in detail from Sina Wong's report. For me, the most staggering uh, assessment from the Khan's order dealing with a ransom note is this one. Quote, Finally, the handwriting in the original ransom note showed consistently consistency throughout the entire writing. End quote. So, Basically, um, you know, this is like I say, looking at an orange and seeing an apple. Um, and I just find it crazy. You know, it might just be the failure to see attention to detail that you look at the three pages of the ransom note and you just see a fuzz and you say, oh, I don't see anything different with it. Um, I certainly do. The handwriting expert that we've mentioned here does. And I don't think you need to be a handwriting expert to see what is in front of you. She goes on to say, quote, one of the most common means to disguise one's handwriting is to attempt to make the script erratic throughout the text. And so she's kind of saying she doesn't see that. And I just find that uh, I, I find that kind of infuriating. At the top of page 21, she summarizes her position, quote, nevertheless, the writer does not appear to have been trying to disguise his or her handwriting, end quote. Oh, really? In tomorrow's episode, we'll be looking at the way that the judge and I guess Team Ramsey seem to me to be sort of conjuring straw into gold, where they basically say, this apple is an orange and this orange is an apple. And even more incredibly, you've got six people saying that. I don't know why they couldn't have used more. Couldn't they have had 60 handwriting experts? I mean, what would have been enough? We also deal with the Colorado Bureau of Investigations expert, Chet Yubowski, and we also deal with what was left out regarding Chet Yubowski's testimony or his evidence regarding the handwriting analysis. 
I noticed that Donald Foster isn't mentioned here, and he's another expert that found that the handwriting, I think he testified during the grand jury testimony, is another expert who testified that he thought that the handwriting was Patsy's. On YouTube, one of the comments from you guys was to say, you know, it's just absolutely clear that Patsy didn't write the ransom note. And my response was, you're right, it is so clear. It's so clear that that this is why 25 years later we're still talking about it because it's so absolutely clear that it's not her handwriting. And of course, we're not talking about anyone else's handwriting. We're not talking about anyone else, any other person whose handwriting is a proxy for the ransom note. You know, if I have this dismay for, for example, the Khan's order, I think that dismay gets even worse when I look at some of the comments and I sort of feel like, have we made any progress? All the books that have been written, all the documentaries that have been made, all the information that's available, all the archives that are available online, have we made any progress in this case? And the answer seems to be no. The answer seems to be that it is possible to fool most of the people most of the time and all you've really got to do is put a deluge of um, smoke and mirrors out there and what you're going to achieve is the result that we have here which is that you're going to confuse people you're going to leave them muddled and I think the Ramsey case is a good example of a case that has much broader ramifications. In other words, it's a case that demonstrates how you can conjure reality and you can also change the facts and you can change reality in a way that is going to suit a particular agenda, it's going to suit a particular outcome. And I think that is what is happening in our world today. And I find it terrifying. I find it terrifying that that it's possible and I find it terrifying that it, if anything it is getting worse. And I think the only antidote to this sort of thing is authenticity, is people that you can trust, people that are credible, people that you can rely on, people who don't have agendas, people who can't be bought, people who aren't part of some kind of system. But how many of them are there out there? I also think you've got to ask the question, what happens when this is allowed to happen? What happens when you're allowed, for example, in the Ramsey case, the bottom line is that um, the, it's all Boulder Police's fault. So in other words, you can't trust law enforcement. At the same time, you can't trust the justice system, right? And so you've got people split down the middle, um, half that don't trust the Ramseys and they don't trust what happened there. And the other half, they don't trust the legal system. And then you sort of get other scattered groups who think that it's some other conspiracy. I've just heard a audio of Fleet White saying that, that a conspiracy that went out was that the, the Boulder police accused Fleet White to almost distract attention or to put pressure on the Ramses indirectly or something like that. And that just is a conspiracy that has no truth to it. The, 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 the whites were scapegoated, which in the end took attention away for some time from the Ramses. But it wasn't something that the Boulder police came up with. And, you know, in a situation like Boulder, you can say, well, whatever happens in Boulder, so what? But when you have a situation like that happening in the, let's say, the state of Colorado, and then you say, beyond the state of Colorado, it's happening in America, and beyond America, it's happening in Great Britain. Beyond Great Britain, it's happening in other countries like South Africa and Mexico and, you know, all these other countries. Then you have a situation that what is actually happening? Chaos. Chaos is happening. And if you think about, you know, like Marvel movies, you think about someone like Loki, they thrive when everyone is running around muddled and confused. They rise to power, the tricksters, right? And that is why we need to know what is going on. We need to know what the truth is, what the facts are. And we need to rely on true crime rocket science in, t in terms of true crime, but we also need to develop our own kind of rocket science in, in the real world. We, know, we need to know who people are. We need to know when they're telling the truth, that people stand for truth. 
And if we can't do that, you have more and more people who just are sort of wishy-washy going through life, wondering how things are going to resolve themselves. And now they're going to resolve themselves, probably at your expense. Someone is going to make use of the befuddlement to get their agenda ahead. And for, for as long as they can do that, they're going to push this agenda of confusion and chaos. And that's just unacceptable in a world where we've got access to so much information, where we shouldn't be confused, where we should be able to know right from wrong, truth from lies. And something like the ransom note is just a simple example where can you look at it and see it for what it is? Can you? Do you? I think I'm going to be putting a poll on YouTube, so look out for it. Do you think the handwriting is Patsy's? Yes or no? So check it out. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you tomorrow for Episode 7 in the Khan's Order.